Have you ever visited a place again and again all your life and think you know it well? And then one day you stop and realize that through all those years, you've only ever seen one side or a small part of that place. That there's a whole other side that you've hardly ever seen that is wholly unfamiliar, that beckons with promises of things truly strange, novel, and wonderful. For me, that's this boardwalk and the famously Russian-speaking neighborhood at the other end of it, Brighton Beach. We came to Coney Island today for the beloved Mermaid Parade, a spectacle that attracts people from all corners of the city and elsewhere to celebrate the start of summer. But I've decided to leave behind the parade, this beautiful American madness, to cross the boardwalk into Brighton Beach, an ethnic enclave whose people, food, and traditions I know so little about. A neighborhood home to communities at the forefront of mankind's struggle between freedom and persecution. Established by immigrants who long ago escaped autocratic regimes, and swelling with newer arrivals whose loved ones are still waging existential battles today. People who brought their language, their culture, their cuisine, but also a fuck ton of history along with them. A past very profound, very real, and one which is still shaping global affairs today. We're talking the Silk Road, the Iron Curtain, War on Terror, Ethnogenocide, both world wars of the past and the horrifying risk a world war yet to come. Since about the 1970s or so, when you hear Brighton Beach, you think Russian. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, other immigrants, newly freed from the Soviet sphere, began settling here. Georgians, Uzbeks, Kazakhs, people from Eastern European and Central Asian countries that many Americans, myself included, maybe aren't so familiar with. All right, and then, so the question becomes, how do you get to know a set of cultures and cuisines that you know next to nothing about? Well, one good place to start, as always, is with the local market. Markets in Brighton Beach are whirlwinds of activity. Each one, an entire galaxy of curiosities to taste and explore. Let's see what we have so far. You see a couple of themes showing up again and again. Smoked fish, cured meat, brined and pickled fruits and vegetables. Preservation techniques, which shows you the history, right? This is characteristic of cultures that had to make perishable food last, which makes sense here. <laughs> Just another example in the course of human history of how necessity gives rise to culture. Oh, we're getting serious in this episode. Now, all of these places were intense, cramped, congested, full of busy people with no patience for curious onlookers such as myself. But nowhere else had the kind of panic-inducing, organized chaos found in this place. 
primarily Uzbek, but catering to all, complete with its own security detail after being attacked with Molotov cocktails six months after opening. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Tashkent Supermarket. where the locals like to eat, you can't do much better than this place. Always busy and pretty much universally recommended, we grab the table outside beneath the roar of the train, excited to have some great Russian and Ukrainian food. Look at this cup. This thing is badass. It's like more Viking than the Viking pass. I know. <laughs> this place had great people watching and even better food. We got some Vreniki. Dumplings filled with creamy potatoes and topped with rich caramelized onion and some pelmeni, ear-shaped dumplings with veal inside. The taste of the veal is very nice. You don't taste like a lot of spices or seasoning in it. You just get like that beautiful veal flavor. Just like completely filling your mouth. And that's really all you need. No hot sauce here. Which you could be like, like elf with the syrup. Just pull some out of my sleeve real quick, you know, <laughs> up. All the dishes I tasted here were delicious, but I was really looking forward to trying one famous soup in particular, borscht. So on the menu, there were two different types, Ukrainian borscht or the green borscht, and the green borscht was offered as either hot or cold. Today, I just wanted to try the Ukrainian one because I heard, like, that's the best version. I've never had borscht before, so this is, like, completely new for me. Yeah, it's beady, but not like overwhelmingly so. You know how beets like that, that really deep, earthy flavor? This has like a hint of beet flavor, but it's not like bam, like from the grass, beet. This is nice. Do sour cream on your nose. Got sour cream on my nose? You're good. Good. That's good stuff. In February 2022, Russia shocked the world with its invasion of Ukraine, the largest conventional war on the European continent since World War II. And here in New York, thousands of miles away, no neighborhood has been more impacted by the war than Brighton Beach. In a community also known by its nickname, Little Odessa, in reference to the besieged Ukrainian port city, the war has ignited a tremendous reaction among its residents, many of whom have family back in Russia or Ukraine, either in danger or actually fighting in the conflict. So the Ukrainian flag is everywhere you go, on storefronts, hanging out of apartment windows, on cars, just on the street. Signs of solidarity with the struggle of the Ukrainian people are everywhere. For some, the war has stigmatized the Russian flag and other cultural symbols. Days after the invasion, the local institution Taste of Russia took its sign down to rebrand itself as international food in the hopes of broadcasting to the community its hope for inclusivity and peace. Despite the conveyance of goodwill, there is a real threat of backlash. All across the city and country, misplaced resentment has caused Russian-owned or even simply Russian-speaking stores to see their business suffer, as many have become the targets of boycotts and harassment because of a war they never asked for, for which they had nothing to do with. For others, the invasion hits in a different way. With Jewish historical roots going back long before it ever took on its Russian character, the neighborhood has more Holocaust survivors than anywhere else in the city. For many of these older residents, the conflict is a terrible reminder of the horrors of war they struggled to escape. I 
All right, well, I think it's about time we get some serious eating done around here. Let's go. First up, the cuisine of the Georgians, themselves no strangers to Putin's war machine. Welcome to Georgian House, where you can eat like you're in the South Caucasus, right here in Brooklyn. Hachapuri, pillowy buttery bread, together with a salty and delicious Georgian cheese, offered in many different varieties. We got two kinds, the Imbaruli, where the cheese is stuffed on the inside of the bread, and the Ajaruli, shaped like a boat with the cheese in the middle and topped with a raw egg and slice of butter. Both absolutely spectacular. These guys are new for me, Hinkali, giant dumplings filled with savory beef and a wonderfully flavorful stock, eaten by grabbing the top and nibbling out an opening in the dough through which you sip the liquid. Then, down the hatch. Really fantastic. Looking at these, you can't help but think of Xiaolong Bao, the famous soup dumplings from Shanghai. And that's no accident. It's here that we can really see the influence of the Silk Road, those networks of roots and cities that for nearly 2,000 years connected east and west across Eurasia. That great exchange of not only goods, food, and cooking techniques, but people, culture, religion, philosophy, weapons, and disease too. The cultures that make up Brighton Beach are united, either by the Soviet Union and the Russian language, or by the shared paths of facilitating trade along the Silk Road, or both. Their cuisines have come to reflect that history, mixing together regional elements to remarkable and delicious results. Moving on, time for something sweet. At Gulu Olu, you can cop some of the best baklava on the face of the planet, shipped straight from Istanbul and prepared stateside by trained professionals. There's a lot of dispute on the origins of this dessert, but we know the Greeks introduced the phyllo technique. It was spread throughout Eurasia via the Silk Road, and the Ottoman Empire perfected the dish. Look at these things, they're like works of art, as beautiful as they are delicious. One of the best things about eating in New York is you never know when you'll come across something unexpected which completely blows you away. High Food Cafe specializes in the cuisine of another integral link of the Silk Road, Armenian cuisine, which I'd never had before and there's a good chance you haven't either. And let me tell you something, we've been missing out. I heard the thing to get was a lamajun with cheese, a flatbread topped with meat, onions, garlic, herbs and spices that can be folded up and eaten on the go like a slice of pizza. Let me tell you, this thing is fucking hot. Look at that beautiful grease there at the bottom. This is one of those things I've never had before, but I can tell you just looking at it, I am really gonna like this. Yo. Not fucking good, man. It was almost like a giant quesadilla, but with a completely different flavor profile. Addictively delicious. A dish that more people need to know about. This right here, this is really fucking good. Any day that I get to have some food that I've never had before, and it's really good, that's a great day. In this life, culture is everything. Shaping our experiences and our relationships with the world around us, it is something sacred to be celebrated, cherished, and preserved. To quote one 20th century philosopher, culture is the bedrock, the final wall against which one leans one's back in a godforsaken chaos. And while true, it's also the case that sometimes to the powers that be, culture becomes a threat, something to be contained, controlled, and in some cases, outright eliminated. The final leg of our exploration of these Silk Road cuisines brings us here, to Kashgar Cafe, one of only a handful of restaurants in the city specializing in the food of the Uyghur people, a Muslim ethnic minority native to China's Xinjiang region. 
nomadic traders with a history dating back thousands of years and whose importance to the movement of goods along the Silk Road cannot be overstated. They have lived under the authority of many different rulers over the centuries, with varying degrees of autonomy. In recent decades, however, the Chinese government has ramped up its campaign of subjection against the Uyghurs, leading to an onslaught of human rights abuses that some have equated to ethnogenocide. And while not the most appetizing of stories, it provides a critical context to the meal ahead, which cannot be ignored. In the 1980s, the Uyghurs actually enjoyed a brief cultural renaissance as the CCP instituted policies that promoted greater tolerance for Uyghur religious and social traditions. But as the Soviet Union lost control over the republics under its administration and ultimately disintegrated, the Chinese state grew fearful and began to see the separatist sentiment pervasive among the Uyghurs as a threat to its power. Since then, China has been steadily intensifying its Uyghur oppression, resulting in a considerable backlash and rising tensions between Uyghurs and the dominant Han Chinese ethnic group. Events such as the Urumqi riots of 2009 that left nearly 200 people dead and other instances of Uyghur on Han violence has led the Chinese government to pursue Big Brother-like counterinsurgency techniques against the Uyghurs. Instituted under policies cloaked in the language of the West's war on terror against Islamic extremism. Accounts of mass surveillance backed by artificial intelligence, criminalization of beards and prayer rugs, compulsory sterilization and abortion, forced labor, torture, medical experiments, and organ harvesting have all been reported in recent decades. Most recently, it is estimated that several million Uyghurs and other undesirables have been rounded up and imprisoned in heavily guarded detention camps. Camps whose existence the Chinese government at first denied, but ultimately acknowledged, referring to them as vocational schools, institutions where members of its society, like the Uyghurs, could learn how to assimilate and be led away from extremist thought. And even went as far as to claim they were actually liberating the Uyghur Muslim population. Yeah, fucking right. With all that said, I was very much looking forward to this meal. You know, by this point, I'd spent a lot of time at Brighton Beach and learned far more about the people here than I ever imagined. And I'd really grown to become quite fond of the neighborhood. Aside from all the great food, there's an incredible community here, full of interesting, hardworking people. It's a lot more diverse than people give it credit for with cultures whose contributions to the world around us really deserve a lot more recognition. I think anytime we let our curiosity get the better of us and we start asking questions about what's on the other side of the familiar, it can only be a good thing for the world. I'm happy I decided to see what this place is all about. We started the meal off with some Korean style carrot salad, julienne carrots with vinegar, garlic, and explosions of flavor from coriander seeds. You may be wondering what Korean dishes are doing here, given that we've been mostly talking about Central Asian cuisines, and it's a good question. It's actually a direct result of Joseph Stalin's regime right around the Second World War. Fearing cooperation with the Japanese, Soviet leadership deported Soviet Koreans by the thousands, taking people from their homes, literally, and dropping them off in distant foreign lands to fend for themselves. Those who survived had to adapt, and in trying to replicate food from their homeland, such as kimchi, they created dishes like this. It's another example of the rich history behind the cuisines and communities that have flourished here. We also got the fried monte, a type of dumpling found all over Central Asia, filled with meat, cabbage, and black pepper, with a tangy tomato sauce for dipping. It was good, but left me feeling like it didn't need to be fried. I have a feeling the traditional steamed version would probably have been better. Now the lagman, really, really good. A beautiful plate of hand-pulled noodles topped with lamb and a colorful array of peppers, onions, garlic, and yard-long beans. Look how the sauce and spices cling to the noodles, making every bite sing with its tomatoey savoriness. But the real star of this experience were the kebabs. Holy shit. A trio of perfectly char-grilled chunks of meat skewered on the plate and topped with white onion and paprika. Guys, look, I've eaten a lot of great meat in my life. I've eaten more sticks of grilled deliciousness than you can count, than you can conceive of. I'm not lying, I'm not exaggerating for the show, when I say that these were likely the three greatest kebabs, pinchos, or any other kind of stick of meat I've ever had in my life. 
veal, lamb, lamb rib. Oh man, the lamb rib. All of them juicy, succulent, tender, the incredible taste of meat cooked over fire that just wakes up your primal instincts. Mind-bendingly delicious. Sinking my teeth into those juicy chunks of meat and ferociously sliding them off the skewer was indeed my happy place. In that moment, I felt like a king, or at least a really happy fat guy in Brooklyn. The meal was a perfect summation of all the Central Asian themes present throughout this journey. Korean-style carrots from a diaspora community, the East Asian influence in the dumplings, kebabs, originally Middle Eastern, a menu without pork owing to Muslim religious requirements, a beautiful, harmonious confluence of all these different regional cuisines. It was an experience so good, I returned a couple of nights later to have it again, this time opting for some samsa, a baked pastry dough filled with lamb and onions, and the lagman, but fried. Topping it with the spicy chili sauce on the table brought the noodles to a whole nother level. Kashkar Cafe, a truly wonderful Brighton Beach establishment. All right, guys, so that's it. Brighton Beach. It's a really dope neighborhood full of so much history and amazing things to see and eat. If you ever get the chance, you should come check it out for yourself. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Turn on your notifications so you don't miss out on the latest eating adventures. And remember to follow us on social media. That's a wrap for this one. I'll see you guys next time on Vinny Eat World. Thank <laughs> you.